gossip. What's up, world? You're tuned into 423 FM. You already know we've got you covered with your daily dose of celebrity drama. Now let's get into it. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the 423. If you're an avid watcher of YouTube and also happen to love food, it's safe to say you've probably seen at least one video from Bon Appetit. Honestly, even if you're not someone looking for recipes or anything like that, it's pretty impossible to ignore these videos because they're always on recommended, always on trending, and just so ubiquitous that they've probably piqued your interest at one point or another. Now, people online are coming for Bon Appetit following their response, or lack thereof, to Black Lives Matter protests, their lack of black employees, and evidence of their editor-in-chief, Adam Rappaport, doing brownface for Halloween. With so many brands coming out to speak about the current state of our country, Bon Appetit's response was pretty lackluster, simply posting a black square that says food has always been political and saying they stand with George Floyd. Understandably, the comments on this post pointed out a lot of issues within their company, like this comment that says, Not gonna lie, the test kitchen not having a single black face says a lot about the company. This is a nice message. Let's see how you stick with it and what changes you make in the long run. There isn't a single young black chef that can watch your programming and see someone that they physically identify with. Following this, a Puerto Rican food columnist named Ileana Masonette posted screenshots of a conversation she had with Adam Rappaport after one of her pitches to the mag got shut down. First, on June 4th, she tweeted, Months ago, I pitched Bon Appetit about Afro Boricuas that make regional rice fritters. One of the editors said, Sounds like a story that could have been told five years ago. And they published another Euro ingredient story. Bet if I pitched it today, they'd buy it. Hashtag solidarity my ass. A couple days later, she followed that up with another tweet writing, Some of you have asked what happened with Bon Appetit. Nice of you to ask. I got a letter from Adam Rappaport this morning. Here is a series of IG DMs we shared moments ago. Adam wrote, Hey, saw your tweet. Thank you for raising the issue. And I'm sorry you received a flip response like that. Do you recall who exactly you spoke to or how things were communicated? I will look into it. Thank you. And as a brand, we got work to do and we need to evolve. We know that in the coming year, you can hold us accountable by our actions and the content we create. And she responded, Hey, Adam, I received the response from Merrill. Though we don't need stories to be exclusively about new trends, there needs to be some undercurrent of newness to our stories and this feels like something that could have just easily been written five years ago or five years from now. I've pitched several times and none have taken, which is fine because that happens. But to have a response to a story like that that has never been published and turn around and have Molly Baz in Pinones in May's issue of BA is like WTF. So Pinones is not evergreen when it's the only area anyone ever writes about. I've been sitting on this issue since last year, and only decided to post about it when A, I finally saw the Molly Baz feature, and B, like everyone else, because you claim to show solidarity. Did I mention that I'm the first Puerto Rican food columnist in the country? I've been published in various places, including Saver Print. Hey, thank you for getting back to me. I will talk to Merrill. And I hear you about the Pinones thing, though Molly didn't do that piece. It was by a Puerto Rican freelancer we had worked with prior. The recipe thing is tough in that Merrill, I think, was communicating something that I've said, though perhaps the nuance gets lost. At BA, compared to Saver, readers expect stories to reflect what's happening right now in the food world. And that's generally what we try to do, but not always. Rick Martinez has done his carnitas recipe, Priya many of the Indian recipes she grew up with, Andy Baragani his favorite Persian dishes. The thing is, these are all staffers and their path to a green light is so much easier than a freelancer coming in cold with a pitch, as I'm sure you know. I guess the question back to Merrill would be, if this piece doesn't feel right now, how can we tweak it to make it feel more right now? Because we don't have enough PR food on the site, plenty of other Latinx cuisines, but Puerto Rican. So, what's the way in? And as a brand based in New York, where there's so much Puerto Rican food that so many of us eat on the regular, there should be a way in. She responded, Readers expect stories to reflect what's happening right now in the food world. I'm still confused how Pinones fits that bill. I don't remember offering a recipe in that pitch, and even if it was, it could have easily been discussed to 86. I'm definitely certain listening to your three POC staff token writers, two of which are white presenting, 
is helpful in ensuring I'm aware of the diversity BA has shown. But I get that their avenues are less congested when it comes to getting ideas accepted as their staffers. That still doesn't deflect from the fact that you don't have any Puerto Rican stories or recipes, especially being in NYC and there is a large but disappearing PR community. I wrote about that for my column in 2018 when I went to the Puerto Rican Christmas dinner at the Beard House. I hope you're not personally asking me what's the way in. That's labor for y'all to do. So let me pitch you about writing a print story of one of the last remaining Puerto Rican restaurants in NYC that has a legacy. They're still open during all of the turmoil, coronavirus, and protests. And let this be documented here for fear it'll be stolen and given to a staff writer to write about. Adam said, to be clear, I'm saying it's the job of the editor and writer together to figure out if there's a way to make the story stick, regardless of who the writer is or what the subject matter. But in general, I think it's really hard to pitch a publication you haven't worked with before, and it can be really frustrating, which is definitely one reason I've never been a freelance writer. You need a lot of metal, as I'm sure you've experienced. As for pitching a story, I would honestly start with digital, if only because A, that's where the vast majority of our restaurant coverage lives, and B, our lineups for September, October, and November are already finalized, and December is, as always, going to be holiday-focused. And in all of the issues, as is always the case, the recipe content drives most of the issues. And oh yeah, why piñones? Fair question. The unofficial theme of the issue was accessible, affordable summer escapes that you could do in a weekend. So whether that's a clam shack in Massachusetts or a food truck in Minneapolis or Ben on Eagle in Asheville or an old-fashioned snow cone joint in New Orleans, we want to get diversity of geography and cuisines. And the last thing she wrote was accessible. As I leave this discussion, you should really focus on that word. Because even after all this, that's what you're always going to focus on. What's accessible equals what's comfortable. So within this exchange in the whole magazine's history, it's obvious that representation within certain communities is just not there. And like many other highbrow food resources, Bon Appetit is known for taking recipes from other cultures and whitewashing them instead of bringing in someone more qualified to take on that task. Of course, a lot of people had a problem with these responses from Adam Rapoport including him mentioning one of the reasons for a lack of Puerto Rican dishes being that Bon Appetit wants recipes to be accessible for readers when their developers have never hesitated to show European dishes that take 50 ingredients over five days. So like Masonette mentioned, Rapo doesn't actually mean accessible, he means comfortable. Following this is when things really started to go downhill as someone uncovered a picture of Adam dressed up as a Puerto Rican for Halloween I don't know why Adam Rappaport simply doesn't write about Puerto Rican food for Bon Appetit himself. And in the photo, which is now deleted, his friend caption says, TBT to me and my poppy at Rappo4, hashtag Boricua. So all of this information coming together really makes Bon Appetit's editor-in-chief look terrible, not only because they've always had a problem with diversity in their kitchen, but because they're posting about spotlighting more Black-owned businesses and saying they have work to do while still shutting down people who come to them with recipes from their culture and opting to let their white editors do it themselves. Now, some of the faces from the BA Test Kitchen are coming forward to speak out about these issues, with Sola calling for Rappo's resignation, along with telling her own horror stories from working at Bon Appetit, including her revealing that only the white talent is paid for their video appearances. She wrote the following. I'm angry and disgusted by the photo of Rappaport in brownface. I've asked for his resignation. This is just a symptom of the systematic racism that runs rampant within Condé Nast as a whole. I've been at Bon Appetit for 10 months. I'm 35 years old and I have over 15 years of professional experience. I was hired as an assistant editor at 50k to assist mostly white editors with significantly less experience than me. I've been pushed in front of video as a display of diversity. In reality, currently only white editors are paid for their video appearances. None of the people of color have been compensated. I demand not only the resignation of rapper poor, but also to see by POC given fair titles, fair salaries, and compensation for video appearances. Following her speaking out, Christina, Priya, and Molly also posted statements, all standing in solidarity with their colleagues and denouncing Adam Rappaport. Carla also tweeted about the current heat coming from BA and their lack of black representation, though she didn't mention or call out Adam specifically. On top of this, one of BA's former employees, Alex Lau, also spoke out against the company, revealing that these same issues right now were exactly why he left. 
Yes, I left BA for multiple reasons, but one of the main reasons was the white leadership refused to make changes that my bi POC coworkers and I constantly pushed for. Instead, we were met with meetings about meetings and grand goals of fellowship training programs for POC. That was over a year ago. Nothing has changed. As a person that shopped the Hot 10 restaurants for multiple years, what made me want to leave was when I saw that year after year, I was only shooting Asian and white chefs. As an Asian American, it is not enough to shoot Asian restaurants and call it a day. Asians are no longer marginalized in the restaurant food industry, as much as BA would like to think that. When I asked why we shot food all around the world but haven't touched the entire continent of Africa, their response, oh, you know, the recipes get tricky and readers probably wouldn't want to make the food. Oh, but you'll preach the wonders of three-day-long recipes and 60-hour WP stews. I just got so tired. So tired of shooting the same Reformation, healthy-ish, white girl BS lifestyle that I knew nothing about, while rarely getting the opportunity to feature restaurants slash communities that actually deserve the spotlight. And why the F are we still shooting and writing about chefs that look like a chubby Father John Misty that does New American, aka bastardized Mapo tofu and ashwagandha soda? What was demoralizing was when I'd be pushing so hard to change the publication from within, taking the wins that I could, only to see Twitter and IG pop off about how white and non-progressive BA was. And as much as that hurt to read, they weren't wrong. People weren't aware of my efforts or my fellow bi POC co-workers' efforts because we weren't being listened to by management. Hell, people weren't even aware that the person creating most of the photographs at BA wasn't a white person. To a lot of the outside world, I didn't exist. I've been quiet. I've been quiet about this for so long because I always thought that I could actually change the organization from within, but I was wrong, and quite frankly, I am so glad that the internet is going for BA while holding them accountable. This is the only way that change can happen. Call out the leadership of your favorite publications if you see something wrong. If they silence you, do not back down. There is strength in social media, strength in reader responses. This is a larger issue than the picture, which is irrefutably terrible and sad. This is a systematic problem that needs to be addressed now. Just a reminder that this isn't solely a BA problem. This is a Condé Nast problem. Blame Roger Moore, blame Anna Wintour, blame all the people in Condé corporations that you've never heard of. They are responsible for creating this culture. Obviously, this is a lot of information, but if you've ever watched BA's YouTube channel in the past, you already know that they have a huge diversity problem. That's nothing new. As for Adam Rappaport, who knows if this photo will actually result in him being fired or resigning. That's just something we'll have to wait and see. Anyway, I want to know what you guys think about this. Do you think Adam will leave BA following these allegations? And will the company, one, treat their current POC employees better, and two, hire more diverse talent in the future? Leave your thoughts down below in the comments, subscribe to The Fortune Thief for more videos, and if you like this one, just give it a quick thumbs up. That is it for today. I will see you guys next time. Bye.